Mm. If you wanted to. I'm not sure how smoothly it'll go. Okay, here we go. Um, we're going live. So... Live! Live! We should tell... <laughs> Let me take my glasses <laughs> off to eliminate that horrendous glare. Real Tony and stuff. Should I... Can, can you... Can you... PM me the link so I can at least... Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, um, we are live now. Give us just a second. We are? Yeah, so I'm going to send you that, that link. <laughs> but my zipper is down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's better. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to put it in uh, chat room three, okay? Okay. Greg is using a device that could record or broadcast this call, it says. Yes. Oh, you know what? I got to turn the uh, – I took my light down a little too much. Hold on. I got to boost the ISO. Match yours. There we go. I think we're about similar brightness levels. That'll – what? What? Oh, I just closed my <laughs> – closed my camera on accident. All right. There we go. That's <laughs> <laughs> Huh. All right, can everybody hear us? Uh, hopefully, we should have Philippe without <laughs> echo. You should have me without echo. And both of our volumes should be all right. Um, Philippe, could you go ahead and make a uh, loud sound so that I can see how, how loud that is? Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> all right, I'll take it. Ah! Yeah, that's fine. Unless they complain, then I'll adjust it further. Uh, People, but it's YouTube. No, uh, hmm? Nobody's gonna complain on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. they, they realize they're they're getting stuff for free. So why would why would they? Oh oh hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right. So there we go. I don't. I, I, I'm hitting the green in the thing right there. So for me, it, it's popping up at the level where it should, where my speaking voice should be. So it shouldn't be too quiet. And then I, so I have this and then I'll have, ah, ah, cause if I turn the game uh, up anymore, uh, oh shit, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to really clip. Ah! That's already like, I'm already getting close to the top. Greg set up. Greg up a couple of dBs. I did, but if I keep going, I'm going to... This is why I don't like this mic. Because of this well, see, right here. I mean, I got a problem, too, that if I if I have this uh, good for speaking and then I sing, yeah, it's going to clip. That's so annoying. Here I am speaking. Yep. Yeah, you probably like this better now. So I... Ah! No, I'm almost in the red, so I hope that it's worth the pain for your eardrums there. But remember, <laughs> it's your... <laughs> it's your choice. <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh thanks everybody for coming on this is my friend philippe i've never we haven't done a, a collaboration i don't think i don't think i've ever had I you on a live stream right no uh, this is actually my first ever live stream how oh. awesome is that be sure guys that i've you never check participated out... oh, i love it so be sure guys you check out philippe's um channel it's called mr mr opera yes on youtube uh, great stuff. He's working super hard at making videos that um, look good and are, you know, good quality content. Um, so, and I really like them. And I'm just going to shout Philippe out here for a minute <laughs> real quick before we get started. <laughs> but um, uh, I've learned a lot from Philippe, so I'm super excited for this one. I've really, I'm the kind of person and I... I'm the kind of person that doesn't say I'm the kind of person, first of all. So I'm saying that because I resonate a lot with um, Philippe's ideas. And I like to take things that I think are good and work and are useful and uh, steal them, basically. So Pablo Picasso said, uh, you know, good artists copy, great artists steal. And I think, you know, teaching um, and thinking and like being a, a good human is uh, kind of like an art. You know, so when I see good things, I like to uh, <laughs> borrow them. So I've 
I've uh, what I'm trying to say is basically I think Philippe has a lot of good ideas and a lot of those ideas have influenced me. We've helped uh, we've worked together and collaborated to make a place on the internet together to where singers can practice. It's called the Vocalist Chat Hub. So um, and today we're going to talk about. But anyway, yeah, be sure you check Philippe out on YouTube. I'll I'll put a descri uh, link to his channel in the description below. But today we're going to talk about this idea that uh, classical singing is the best. I think, from my perspective, well, before we jump into that, Philippe, do you want to say anything to them? But I mean, um, we'll probably we'll probably get to it. But the uh, what you were just talking about has been a major two-way street in my life. So uh, maybe people are not used to someone from classical land saying, oh, actually, I'm learning from contemporary singers, from pop singers, from whatever. Uh, the opera world tends to not have a lot of respect for anything outside of their genre. Um, so I should make that clear that uh, people in my life, in my work as a professional opera singer, have noticed big changes that started happening around when I started working with Greg. I not, mean, just Greg. not just not Greg. Not just yeah. Greg, <laughs> no. Uh, uh, right. Uh, you've been a big part of it, um, but... I guess what I'm talking about is more community-based learning mm. um, or community-based, I don't know, self-improvement. I don't know how you would want to, how, how you would uh, define that. Um, but we sing to each other kind of constantly. And when someone comes up with a new idea, they share it. You know, they share it in the group, and then we, people try to imitate it or whatever, and yeah. Yeah, what's funny is we wanted this, uh, <laughs> this video was a sp originally not supposed to be a live stream. It was supposed to be a, uh, <laughs> a video about how to use the internet to sing better. And then we were, I was like, let's not talk about it because I don't really want to, uh, I don't really want to shout out the place that he and I made called the vocalist chat hub currently on Facebook. Uh, shout out to the vocalist. Chat hub. <laughs> um, I was like, I don't want to shout it out too much because don't, I, just do not go. Yeah, to that don't group, go there. People, you... <laughs> because the, I was like, because we're going to switch platforms soon. We're going to move it to discord and we're, we're just going to make some changes. And I was like, we don't want to like inundate the chat hub with a bunch of people and then move it. And that would be like, like we should move it and then do that. So, but you know, yeah, so and it's like a, actually you are okay. People are welcome to come and join, but we are we're starting to realize that we can't. We're really limited as far as uh, bringing new people in because um, because we need like these moderators and stuff for. It. So it's like for for every member who's just there to sing, you you need like one moderator. Yeah. <laughs> so it's. Um, yeah, and, and it's and, a, it's like a lot of manual labor and people donating their time, yeah. and, uh, and we so need, that's yeah. That's... And we need a platform that makes it easier, like to make that happen. So Discord has like bots and stuff, but then there's a problem with Discord because Discord's hard to send audio messages and record directly into it, and Messenger has yeah. that like really like is one of its strong suits. So it's just hard. It's gonna take some investment from us to make that work, like hiring somebody to code or something to code in if any of you guys want to be a part of that <laughs> and would like to uh trade you know some lessons or something for uh, <laughs> uh some coding skill i would like <laughs> a discord server to be able to record uh directly from your phone into it. anyway all right so let's get started with our topic which is is classical vocal technique the best vocal technique and this is like when i say that at this point to me it really does feel silly coming out of my mouth it feels like <laughs> like i laugh but it it like i i say that because now i'm surrounded by people and i'm that don't think that that like we see the silliness in that idea and we see the the that that's not the truth and so then it's like <laughs> you laugh but as a beginner you know 
as somebody that's just yeah. more just starting out or somebody that's been influenced by people heavily that do believe that let's say your first vocal teacher was like oh this is what classical singing is and like that's why it's so important like this is the foundation of everything and da -da 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 -da. and then you start you just accept that and then you think well it that must be true right like what she's saying or he's saying and so you just kind of run with it and so we there's like these <laughs> little seeds inside of us planted you know that like it is the best it is the truth and yeah we want to talk about today um if that really is the case why or why not i i think m like maybe should first mention kind of a a decent argument for okay i'll let you and do that that would be the, the idea of skills transfer um and so for, so for instance, if you're putting together, you're a country and you're trying to put together, I don't know, a ski jump team, uh, and you just don't have enough people in your country that are really into the ski jump, um, and you want to develop this sport for your country, a good place to go look is like the Summer Olympics athletes who have nothing to do in the winter. <laughs> Or, or who have less to do, whatever. Because a, like a top level sprinter or a top level, I don't know, hurdles or anything, um, they're going to, it's gonna be a lot quicker training them and getting them proficient because some of those skills will transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, but at, you know, at the same time, you could be a really good pole vault or, or whatever. If I put a pair of skis on you, and throw you down a hill, you have no idea what to do unless you've actually <coughs> um, done those. And then I guess another problem with this argument is that if it's true that the skills transfer, then shouldn't they also transfer in the other direction? So from contemporary singing into opera. Mm. I, I think um, it's very true, the idea of skills transfer, like, but it only transfers if you do it right. So. Um, <clears throat> if you what I mean by that is um, let's say that you learn to sing opera but you don't or you learn you get classical training to sing classical music but you don't really understand what you're doing with your body like you don't really understand what's producing that sound you just start to like reinforce these habits and over time that just kind of becomes your default your habit your standard and you don't really know how you're doing that it's just kind of your thing and that would yeah. make it really hard to, to not to switch because <clears throat> part of the skill, <clears throat> and in my opinion, the correct way to um, develop vocal technique is to really learn key aspects about what it is that you're doing and how you're doing it because that's going to make what you're doing uh, memorable. You're going to be able to go like, oh, okay, I'm going to be able to remember this later. I, and then you're going to be able to do different things. So that skill is learning how to move your body in certain ways to produce sound and how to think a certain way, how to act a certain way. And then that is a transferable skill because if you learn to do that, to take your voice from sucking to good in a certain context by doing that, by learning how to maneuver your body. Oh, I got to open my mouth like this. Oh, my tongue kind of has to lift right here. And if I don't do yeah. that, this happens like that kind of process. If you do that, um, that's transferable. So if we had took an opera singer that learned to sing opera that way, and then they were like, you know what? I want to sing like rock music. It's totally different. But the skill that's transferable is the one where they can say, oh, you know what? I've already figured out how to use my body like this. So let me just like learn to use it another way. Yeah. But if you're just like this, like uh, I'm just reinforcing these things and you're kind of mindlessly singing um, and you're not really like super duper focused on what you're doing. Um, and like aware of what you're doing, then it's going to be really hard. And I actually think that's most yeah. of uh, people that try to cross genres because most of them are very it's, are unsuccessful. And I think we that's don't have a good track record. Yeah, well, it's not just opera singers, <laughs> but I think that that's because vocal training and vocal technique is um, what we have. Like how it's yeah. taught, how it's presented is is bad. It's not good, you know. Uh, hold on, I gotta get a sweater because I'm shivering and I can hear it in my voice. I'm like, oh, this is... <laughs> hold on, I'm cold. <laughs> hold on. <laughs> so, 
So while he's gone, you should unsubscribe from Greg and subscribe to my channel. And no, just I'm just kidding. <laughs> Is this this stays live while you go away, right? Oh crap. Um, Okay, we are back. We are back. By the way, guys, please uh, like this video. Only uh, four of y'all have, and there's 20 of y'all. So I don't know why you you guys always forget. Okay. <laughs> anyway, but please like this video. It helps me out. It'll get this video more attention. It'll get my channel more attention. So you guys, 16% suck. Yeah. <laughs> if you appreciate me, like the video to show that. Okay, so uh, let's continue. Wait, We're... I got my math. Totally wrong. It's anyway. okay. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> um, we're singers, all right? We don't need to do math. <laughs> yeah. Tony yeah. says I unliked yeah. it. I like it. Um, so. Um, we're out of 20%. That's, that's 20%. Yeah, there we go. Okay. 80%. <laughs> so, um, yeah, where are we? Um, uh, skills transfer. Skills, skills transfer. Uh, so that's the argument is that. The argument that people say when they're saying is classical technique the best is it is the hardest thing to do to learn t classical singing. Um, and like it's if you can do that, you can do anything, basically. Like that's the ultimate. That's their foundational yeah. argument. If you can do it, then you can do the other stuff. And they, they don't <laughs> even say if you can do this, you can learn anything. They, they literally, and th this is a very common thing for teachers of classical singing to say. Um, they will say that if you, if you learn classical singing, like already now, you can, you can sing anything. And then it's, it's like, well, then how come you can't? <laughs> or, <laughs> like if that was true, yeah. then why can't you sing, you know, <laughs> right. anything? I, I think it's just based off the evidence, it's a, it's a really false claim. Um, you yeah. have to really have some severe cognitive dissonance going on <laughs> to believe that like that's true because all you have to do is hear. Like the proof is in the pudding. You know, it, we have to <clears throat> evaluate that claim. There's no, <clears throat> I mean, that's not none, but like usually if you see somebody making that claim and they do sing classical music, then they go to sing contemporary and you know, they don't sound that good. And there's so many examples of like flops. If you listen to Pavarotti, it was a great opera singer. <laughs> and then when he's singing pop, you know, he sounds like an opera singer singing pop. So that's the singing. thing. Yeah. If you <laughs> successfully are transferring the skill of like learning, you're going to sound like you're actually singing the genre. You're not going to sound like an opera singer singing it. So, um, yeah we have to think about like what vocal technique even is and what it, what we should be thinking of vocal technique as. Right. So, uh, I think that that's <clears throat> something that's, um, really important because if, <clears throat> I, if you think of uh, vocal technique as like the healthiest singing or learning to use your voice the right way or something like that. Right. Um, that can be a little bit of a slippery slope because you can start to conflate that with, uh, you know, the genre and the sounds that you are supposed to be making for your genre as being the healthiest. So a, a good example would be if you are, um, um, <coughs> if you're singing opera, <coughs> so much fun. Uh, if you're singing opera and <laughs> the sound is going to be darker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're singing <coughs> opera, <coughs> opera, if you're singing opera, if you're singing opera, if you're singing opera, right? <laughs> How many times have I said if you're singing opera now? <laughs> I'm sorry, Greg. If you're singing opera, okay, uh, the sound's going to be dark darker compared to other styles of singing and then you could say right so there's going to be certain things going on certain sensations and certain sounds so we're gonna have a darker sound 
we're gonna have the low the, the larynx lower the soft palate is usually going to be raised um, and we're going to have this sort of sound design or sound ideal right it's going to have a certain yeah. like we all recognize it as classical Ooh, that doesn't sound like something i would do if i were singing the justin bieber sound at, at all so it's kind of got this like you know shaping to it so where where it gets dangerous with the vocal technique like defining it is starting to mix up that certain sound that works for your genre with what's healthy or correct and i think this is the biggest mistake that people that say classical vocal technique is the best make because they'll say don't raise the larynx <clears throat> like raising the larynx is what you got to do to not get a classical sound yeah, yeah. It, it it gets you know i've done some some research some on purpose some accidental you know just reading things and finding out where these ideas come from. And the biggest offender, I think, was a guy in, he was writing in the 30s and 40s, I think. Uh, his name was Douglas Stanley. And he's he's often cited as like, okay, so for, for instance, if, if um, in speech level singing, they'll say, um, it's a blend of some stuff, and they they use this word bel canto, and that's their word for like classical singing. Um, but what they really mean by that is Douglas Stanley, and you can find kind of uh, really ver some things are just verbatim. So so Douglas Stanley is the first example I can find of someone saying constriction they use this word constriction and they say it's unhealthy mm -hmm. and douglas stanley is really outraged and offended even by what he calls radio singing which is crooning basically the beginning of uh, these contemporary genres are coming from from this era you know that was later developed into pop singing um and, uh, I mean, if you heard it today, you'd probably call it old-fashioned. Um, and you might say even it sounds a little bit like opera. But to them, it sounded completely different. Mm -hmm. And yeah, <laughs> he, he says, and he, he claims that singing this way will give you nodules, like, almost overnight. Um, like, that it's really dangerous <laughs> and unhealthy. And he explains that uh, it's caused by, because the, you're... you're vocal folds are rubbing together and they're going to get a callus and the reason that they're going to be rubbing together is because of constriction and he doesn't give any kind of uh, citation for why like where he came up with this idea how the physics work nothing you know he just kind of like pronounces it yeah and you're expected to just accept that it's true um but then if you try to work out like, well, how does this system work where this constriction is giving you calluses by affecting it like a unrelated, you know, a, a completely different part of your body. Yeah. And then why do all these brass instruments and stuff feature these pretty intense constrictions right near the, the source of the vibrations? And why doesn't that hurt your lips? It, I mean, it doesn't make much sense. Um, and that just gets picked up like it's dogma. Mm -hmm. And now if you ask like uh, an SLS guy, why does constriction cause nodules? They'll tell you, we know from bel canto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and <clears throat> bel canto is given this kind of like uh, authority status mm -hmm. and as far as i can tell there's no there's no logical way that that actually occurred yeah uh, other than than classical singing being the most prestigious singing at the beginning of the era of recorded music i think the a big think, problem is like you just kind of as a singer you just kind of start stepping into the world of singing and then you 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 want to sing you want to get better and you know maybe you go to school for that like you go to a college or a university and then like 
those people have authority, inherent authority, just because they're your teachers and they, you yeah. feel this immense pressure to respect them and to trust what they have to say. And that's, um, that trust is pretty important because, uh, <laughs> you know, you trust your physics teachers at the same university, yeah. you know, in the science classes to know what they're talking about. So why, if you, when you're taking your sort of common core, are you, you, you would say, yeah, they must know what they're talking about. But then when you go to your classes in the vocal world, you would just be like, they're, you know, it's all bullshit. I think that's what's insane about it is that it's almost like we're talking about a conspiracy theory where basically <laughs> the large part of yeah. all universities and people teaching singing in college universities are uh, really wrong about a lot of their fundamental ideas. So a lot of them would agree with the premise that classical vocal technique is the best or the healthiest and should be the starting point for all beginner sing singers. When, when you go into yep. a college program and you want to learn how to sing pop, you don't get to sing pop songs. You get to sing opera. <laughs> you get to sing these art songs or classical songs. You don't get to sing really the songs you like. So th there's this very strong emphasis that you have to learn to sing that way, right? It's pervasive in the curriculum design. And, um, you know, it, it's we're, we're kind of making a bold claim when we say like, you know, the same institutions that are giving out, cor let's say, correct scientific information in other categories are also making like pretty egregious mistakes <laughs> in this other category. So that's <laughs> yeah. that's where it kind of blows my mind, where it's like, wow, like this trust thing is um, not a reliable uh, way to get to the truth. So I think that's pretty hard for beginner singers to hear or people that do trust it because it, it's a little shattering. Because you do want to believe that people have the answer. You do want to believe that your teacher, your classical teacher, your, your teachers at your school, that they know what they're talking about. That it is true because that's the information that you want to help you get better. And if they're wrong, yeah. did you just waste all this time, all these years, like, <laughs> listening and like following this advice that's, you know, bad? Uh, you know, and so that can be a little scary. But I, but I, I think that it's okay. You know, it's not that scary. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There could still be good things about what they're saying, about what they're doing. And, and you know, there will be the argument that it's like, well, it worked for me. You know, it helped me. Their ideas helped me. And it's like, of course, you know, I think there's a lot of good ideas from classical, you know, ideas that are, you know, transferable. Um, yeah. And but at, at the same time, if someone is so this... Although it is a valid argument uh, when someone says it helped me, mm -hmm. I would say this is also one of the most abused arguments uh, because for me to accept that something helped you, there's actually some requirements for that to be rational and logical. So first of all, I have to have some kind of evidence of where you were before. And second of all, I need some kind of evidence of where you are now. Mm. Yep. And then I have to buy your explanation. Uh, and so if you and if you can't actually show me what you were doing before anymore, that's going to actually that's going to put some doubt in my mind that you actually understand the process of how you went from the one thing to the other. Yeah. Uh, because if you really understand that process, you should be able to reproduce your coordination you were using before mm -hmm. and the one you're using now. Uh, but usually when I scratch the surface from, of a classical singer who is using this point, um, either I can't confirm that they got any better by looking at the before and after, or much more common, they will resist demonstrating the after. Mm-hmm. Not just a little bit, like a lot. Yeah. They will struggle really hard. And it makes me think that in the back of their mind, they know it's a lie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's, in my opinion, that's abusing that argument. Where I'll, whereas <laughs> yes. I can show you. Yes, I, I completely agree. And, um, and it's worth mentioning as well that um, <laughs> there's more abuse to, that that argument can have. 
like we got to look at like there is a good point to that argument and there's a there, there's there's a lot of like really of abusing that argument and that's the argument again to to repeat is um there are good elements to classical vocal technique that are transferable skills right that there, th that's true there's some truth there and but um it's it gets really abused and okay what's an example of abuse you are you just graduated high school you go into college you go to your university it's your first year you go into vo voice one a class and um you are not that good at singing let's say right and then you're practicing your singing all throughout the year you know every every week you're, you're working on your singing you're working on these things your teachers are telling you do this and you're like okay right and you start doing it and it's like there's more than just your teacher in this mix right here first of all you're practicing right you have yeah. your own intuition <laughs> you have your own like instincts you are sort of learning to use your body and we can't really <laughs> we can't really uh accurately mix that in and conflate that with um that being your teacher's advice giving you all of that and yeah. why why can't we and and why am i right about this and not wrong because um not everybody gets the same results. <laughs> so that's the proof, right? If it were just about the teacher and those ideas being correct, you would see that like, you would see more uh, of a quality happen, more uh, of an equal distribution across the students that enter. But no, you see some do really, really well and some not do well at all, right? So it's not just the training. If the training was really, really effective, you would probably see it be a bit more equal across the board of like the people coming in, being at the same level, let's say, yeah. and then pr getting better in a similar way at a, at a relatively similar speed, not like some fly ahead and some be sinking past. So to me, that tells me that it, 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 it's inefficient. It's not working well. And some people just understand and are more intuitive and can figure it out and put different pieces together and some can't and this has been my experience um with talking and like listening to singers in college uh courses in classes and listening to the difference in how they approach their voices and and, and what they do right and what ideas they believe like it's so scattered and all over the place and oh, let me play devil's advocate with that one all right um because I know what what they what they air quotes would answer. Okay. Um, they would say, well, the reason for the uneven distribution is that classical singing um, teaches you how to sing healthy, but by by helping you find your natural voice. Oh. And that's just what the I'm natural voice was. <laughs> <laughs> So obviously you can tell I've heard this argument a million times from someone trying to slip out of uh, taking any responsibility for sounding like shit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and it's, it's like they'll say that um, the person that is doing well with the classical vocal technique training is somebody that has like, that's just their natural voice. And the person that isn't doing yeah. as well they have a different natural voice, right? <laughs> and that, and and they'll they'll make this claim, by the way, guys, about their own singing, and they will use it to justify their lack of an ability or an, a skill, right? They they will use it to defend their inability to perform to sing classical, yeah, to sing classical <laughs> or to sing other things, basically just to sing well to fulfill the requirements well, usually, of the genre. Usually, they're they're defending their shitty classical. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So they'll say, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a baritone. I, I think that's probably the number one argument, and it's a very powerful powerful argument, guys. Like, there's a reason that it's very pervasive. It's believable. Well, but yeah. it, it, it's only believable when you accept a ton of other uh, hidden premises sort of snuck <laughs> in there. And what we want to do is kind of dissect that and figure out, mm, are these things kind of adding up together? So, for example, they'll say, oh, well, this person that's got these really good high notes and that's really singing the, these arias, you know, really, really well. And that's really like taking off with their voice. They're just a tenor. So that's easy for them. Right. 
but right. they're using the same technique as you, you struggling baritone that can't sing above F. It's just that that's just your voice type. And so this is their argument to explain this unequal um, this unequal uh, skill yeah. level in the singers in college courses. Uh, you know, I've worked with so many people that have experienced that and been told, you know, I'm a baritone or you're this, or your voice can't do this, it does this. And then they're going like, and then, and they're like, well, I just thought I couldn't do it. You know, I just thought because they told me I couldn't, yeah. you know. And then we 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 do some stuff. We do some real vocal technique uh, training, and yeah. then ta da! Like the high notes start coming. You know, they figure out, oh, that's how that guy's doing that, and it it yeah. the light bulbs come on. And it becomes possible. So I would say, um, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this, but but yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah, where where are you going with that, Greg? <laughs> well, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to save me and segue the conversation. You know, that's not that was no. <laughs> Bad Philippe. <laughs> By the way, guys, if you're coming on, if you're new to the stream and you haven't liked it yet, please like this video. It really helps the channel out. So, um, yes. Yeah. So they, any more of them actually like it now or? Yeah, there's 16 likes and we've got 20, 20 16. Uh, good job, guys. Yeah, thank 80%. you. 80%. Any dislikes? Oh, I don't know. I can't see that from the yeah. stream. Thank God. If we, if, if we had my audience on here, there would be dislikes. That would make me sad. <laughs> it's like 80% <laughs> of my audience. Oh my God. You know what? Your, your, your views, <laughs> though, on your channel do really, really well. Like for your subs, you max out like all your views. <laughs> Which is really nice. It's the hate watching. Yeah, it's the hate watching. <laughs> yeah, you know what? They're they're literally they're literally helping you. <laughs> I know. They're buying me things. Yeah. They're really small things, but yeah. they're buying. <laughs> <laughs> they're buying me things. I love it. All right, thanks for liking the video, guys. I they'll appreciate buy, that. Like, dinner. <laughs> yeah, they'll buy you a dinner. <laughs> thanks, hate watchers. Thank yes. So. Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, okay, so basically we've got when, – when we talk about classical, classical vocal technique being the best, um, we've got um, these things – what I talked about earlier, like the, the stylistic sound of the genre conflate – those sounds start to get equated with what is good vocal technique. And I think the, yeah. the, the biggest example of this is yelling or pulling chest voice, right? Any kind of yelly, shouted kind of character to the voice, you know, everybody's gonna be like, that's bad, right? So, uh, and we only get that kind of equality, by the way, in the upper range. We don't really get a shouted, nobody's like, hey, stop that guy. It doesn't care, it doesn't have the character of a yell, and we're like, hey! And then it starts to sound like, you know, stop that guy! It starts to sound like that's the, the, yell, the yell quality. So it really only emerges yeah. in our upper range. And um, what's interesting is that it's very uh, opposite to what you'd want to do if you're singing in uh, if you if you're singing in a classical uh, style. You don't ever want that sound to sound like a yell in that way. It's got to have a very different right. uh, timbre to uh, it. Ass assuming we're talking about like romantic, so th this is something to to mention. Okay, um, is that when you go to school for classical you're probably going to be thinking about and interacting with the least likely roles for someone to sing and that's that's the big lead roles the romantic lead if you will um most of the jobs in classical singing are not that most of the jobs are going to be supporting characters because if you go to a show, you can't have a show that's all leads. You know, you have a few leads and mostly supporting characters. And if you're one of these supporting characters and you're using some of these sounds, like the yelling sound, for instance, are you not singing classical now? Hmm. You're, you're in an opera. You're mm -hmm. you're a professional singer in an opera. Yeah. Um, and so we sh we should be clear that what we're talking about actually is a subset of classical singing, and that's lyric singing. Okay. And maybe maybe dramatic singing. Okay. 
Um, and uh, yeah, as an opera student, I really had the wrong idea that because for, for, for me, it was like these lead parts or nothing. Um, and that was a bad attitude, even like within the realm of classical singing. Mm-hmm. Um, but just, just to let your audience know that actually like just about anyone could be an opera singer, especially if you don't only mean these, these lyric romantic leads, mm-hmm. you know, or heroic leads or whatever. Um, well, I guess what you're saying kind of makes that, uh, argument sort of cave in on itself because if, um, there, like when we say classical, it's like, uh, and we need to escape these certain sound ideals and this is the right way that the, the reason that that argument caves in on itself is because there's so much variety even within classical is what you're saying. It's like, it's a subset yeah. within classical that yeah. people will claim yeah. this is the right way. But then it's like, well, what about they're just ignoring all the other stuff? And it's like what you said, was it not classical anymore? It just, it's kind of like, it's not <laughs> adding up when you take a, you, 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 when you start to really analyze those claims. So uh, we've kind of, um, I feel like we've, we've, we've tried to destroy it uh, pretty well now. <laughs> uh, what's, what are the good things about classical technique that, or training or even just trying to like make those kind of sounds that you think are good? And, and I want to share my perspective as well from somebody that started yeah. off really wanting to sing just contemporary starting off in musical theater and then drifting more and more and more to pop and away from musical theater and how trying to make classical sounds has helped me along my journey um, and just in, in terms of figuring my voice out. But uh, real quick, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut that light so maybe I'll make my, okay. my video better. Hold on. Oh, that looks nice. That looks nice. Does it? Okay. Yeah, I, I want yeah. our I want our colors to kind of match a little bit better. I think. Oh no, hold on. Something. I, I clicked the wrong thing here. There I got go. the the background blurring because basically what's what's behind me is like. Uh, let's see. By the way. Well, now I don't know how to change it. No worries. I think ah. we're. I think we're so it's a giant, giant collection of mushrooms that I foraged. I like wild, that. wild mushrooms. So, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful wild, <laughs> wild mushrooms. All right. So, <laughs> so um, I guess my um, <clears throat> my perspective on that is um, it is help. The more options you have as a singer, uh, the better, and um, because you understand how to use your voice in different ways. Okay, and that may not be, um, may not make sense at first because you're, you're thinking, for example, um, here's all of the possibilities in within this giant circle. Imagine this is a giant circle um, of singing. And within this like circle, you could fit every possible sound that the human voice could make. And then we're gonna say, well, I wanna sing, let's say rock, this is your circle within the circle now. It's much smaller in terms of like the sounds that you're yeah. gonna be making. You would never make these sounds over here and these sounds over here. They just don't fit, they don't sound right. They're not what you want, right? So you were, are thinking, well, why does me learning to do things outside of my circle, the sounds that I want to make, help me with the sounds that I want to make. Like, it's like, hmm, right? That doesn't seem to add up at first, right? So, um, but, it, but it actually does help. It actually does help you do these things. So uh, that was my experience was, um, I, I, I wasn't focused on doing classical, but by trying to mimic operatic tenors and by trying to like copy those sounds and listening to what they were doing with their voice, I started to, 
I started to expand my ears, I think was like the number one thing. It was like, I was just more aware of how different sounds sound and like different coloring options. And then it was like, oh, this is really cool. Like I just started to like have a more in-depth perception of like voices. It was like, oh yeah, I can hear this kind of like texture in this guy's voice and that's different from the contemporary guy. And I can start to hear more darkness and brightness. And I think that was the bigger thing. Like I started to hear a lot of that contrasting color. And right. then the other thing was me being able to do that with my body. I th when you learn to do something that isn't within your little sphere, your genre, let's call it a genre, right? Um, and you learn to do something that's like over here, that's like outside of it, that helps you know how to do this because part of knowing how to do this is knowing how not to do this. Does that make sense? It's like when you make a decision yeah. and you're like, you know, well, process of elimination. <laughs> not this, not this, not this, not this. Well, let's go with this then, right? So you start going down the list and it, I think it really helps you to be able to know like what you need to avoid so that when you make a mistake, Philippe and I, uh, Felipe and I talked about this on our pulling chest versus mixed voice live stream a few live streams ago. And if you guys haven't seen that, uh, feel free, you know, after this one, go check that out. Lots of good stuff on there. Pulling chest! Yeah. <laughs> but we talked about, Basically, if you confine yourself to only making sounds within your limited thing, sometimes you're going to make a mistake. Sometimes you're accidentally going to go outside of this when you don't want to. And if all you know is this, when you make that mistake, it's going to cost you. It could, it's, it's going to be a lot riskier because you don't know. You're not familiar. You're going to be f afraid, right? And, and you won't have practiced how to get back. Yeah, and okay, and that's a great point. When you start to <laughs> when you start to lose it, and you you go outside, it's gonna be like, oh no, how do I get back to what I did? Because that's a skill in and of itself. When you switch and you lose something, going right back. So it makes the whole thing better, actually, to practice cross training the genres. I mean, you you're talking to a guy, so I, I'm the kind of guy who. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I invented my own pedagogy for classical singing, and that it, in the the iteration that it's in now would have never happened if I hadn't taken a lesson with Ivan. Ivan showed me Edge from CVT and Overdrive. Mm -hmm. And one of the main coordinations I used, I never found it until Ivan showed me how to do Edge. And Ivan, Ivan because, uh, was on the last live stream, the CVT Masterclass guy, yes. by the way. This so, is the same Sorry, I figured everyone about. has watched. No, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're uh, yeah, I'm probably not, but who knows. Uh, we're, we're, right. we're a web. We're a web, and we all know each other. <laughs> Ivan's in the, right. the vocalist chat hub, by the way, too. So is Felipe. So is Tony. <laughs> you guys starting to see the uh, <laughs> connections here? Okay. <laughs> the vocalist chat hub no, is the place to be. Ivan is like this uh, huge CVT resource. He's also mm. yes. extremely knowledgeable about acoustics mm. and uh, all just like all kinds of subjects. Yep. Um, and in the pedagogy that I use on myself, if you will, um, every sound you can make basically boils down to position and motion. Mm -hmm. And then how you get, that's a coordination, if you will. And how you get from where you, where you are, basically, um, naturally, if you will, or habitually, mm -hmm. and, and to that coordination would probably go under what I call attitude. Um, and everyone, every one of us is really creative in that we come up with complicated ways not to do these simple coordinations. So like the, the path between you and the actual coordination might be complicated, but the coordination itself isn't. It, it could have different varying levels of complexity. Um, but where the really creative part comes in is the, the differences you invent between yourself and doing that. 
um, and those are difficult to overcome. Um, and one of the difficulties is they're they're different for everybody. So it's like we're all trying to do the same thing. Essentially, like there's not that much difference between um, the way different people's vocal tracks function. Mm -hmm. But the ways they come up with to uh, not do that specific <clears throat> position in motion mm -hmm. <laughs> and even not be aware of it are like infinite. Yeah, and voice type is like one of those things. Like it's like an excuse. Like my voice is yeah. this, and it, it just doesn't do that. Right. Rather than focusing on what you can do, which is like, how do I like Philippe is saying like how do I adjust my position of my body and the motion yeah. between positions to get a sound right? And maybe how there, do I think how do I think of some clever attitudes that can help me you know yeah. get there as well. I think there. I mean, there is a there is a kernel of truth, especially when it comes to like the raw dimensions of your vocal tract. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you have a really big mouth to begin with, um, you're dealing with a different vocal tract from mine, mm -hmm. and that might inform some of your strategies, mm -hmm. or it might inform like. What, where you choose to specialize mm. should work with what you were born with. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. not as, I mean, if that's not what you want to do, that's not what you want to do. Yeah. Um, but you, when you find yourself competing about against other people for the same job, it starts to become uh, like success and failure starts to be a smaller and smaller tolerance. You know, it mm. starts to be. Yeah very small differences relatively and that's yeah. and that's the point at which i think your body type and dimensions will start to yeah so almost so, have well, where were you yeah. going with this because i'm not i'm just personally not seeing the connection in terms of like how the value from your perspective of classical singing because i think i think you were that's what we well, were i was about. just talking about really yeah it's it's more the value of um, when you interact with someone from a different genre. Oh, I see. Okay. They're, they're, they're actually solving, if they're using different coordinations, they're solving a different set of puzzles. Mm -hmm. So if you, like, if you can't do the coordination now, and we assume that it's possible, mm -hmm. then you have, a, you have a puzzle. How to get from where you are to solving that puzzle and being able to do the coordination. Uh, and the better you get at solving puzzles in general, the better you are at solving puzzles. Right. So, um, so you, and the way the way to do that is to give yourself more puzzles. Right. So <laughs> you're talking about what I was talking about about like the sound and like this genre is this bubble, and then the more you practice expanding those options and solving the problems that come up along the way of trying to do that, the better you're going to be at solving yeah. the own problems within genius. Genius. Look at us vibing telepathy through the cameras we both have the same camera this is this part of it it's oh that's true yeah right. <laughs> so um yeah that makes total sense actually logically if you think about it right you have to solve a set of problems to create certain kinds of sounds unless you just open your mouth and you sound exactly the way you want to singing the style you want to uh nobody ever then you're gonna have to deal <laughs> yeah. with things that come up to stop you like oh man my throat's getting tense when I sing that high. Um, that, I can't do that vowel at that range. Uh, my voice flips when I close my mouth up high. My voice flips when I go quiet. I can't do vibrato. I can't do vocal runs, right? I am off rhythm. It goes on. I'm getting hoarse, yeah. right? Like these are things that are all things I've struggled with, right? And most people yeah. struggle with learning how to sing. And those are some puzzles. And some of those things are unique to certain genres, but every – genre has its own little set of problems and so if you get good at just solving problems using your body in different ways and your mind in different ways the way you're thinking about it right then you're good that's a tr that's the transferable skill that i was talking about in the beginning which is you know yeah. you take if you take the learning process with you it's not about necessarily but i do want to talk about this a little bit the sound ideal of classical music 
tr being a transferable skill. But what should be the real, the, what real transferable skill is if you learn to sing classical music, which is hard to sing. And uh, let's qualify that a little bit by saying if you learn to sing lyrical classical music from the romantic area, uh, that's really hard to sing. Like if you're trying to sing Nessun Dorma or something like, you know, big and loud and strong that's yeah. sailing high notes. I could, fast. I, could, I could qualify that too, that the, the way in which it's going to be hard is the raw physicality of it. That you're, you're going to be operating, uh, especially as far as your posture goes and your, like the movement of your whole body. Mm -hmm. Um, you're you're essentially using your whole body to do something that's like the equivalent of calligraphy. Yeah. Um, and it needs, on the one hand, the power. So you, you so you need to be able to um, like transfer energy. Um, but if you think about things where you use a lot of power, those don't tend to be very precise things. Uh, so you have this combination of precision and power that's really tricky to attain, mm -hmm. if you will. It's still tricky. Uh, I'm not going to say that, that classical singers are all idiots. That's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, and if you f if you want to sing that like uh, powerful Nessun Dorma, for for instance. Um, and uh, let's say you're on your, you, you can do it now, and you're on your way to sing. Um, and on your way, I don't know, you take a hit to your back or something, or, or a leg, and, and now you're not quite 100% mm -hmm. with your body yeah. and, the, and your balance. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a, a lot harder in a way that... Um, Singing some contemporary music perhaps wouldn't be that much harder. You know what I mean? Like for I, the I, same. I, I, I do, and I think this is where, like, if you actually learn to sing classical music at a top level, you do will possess some very impressive skills um, that not um, uh, not necessarily other genres, though some will um, are going to have. And that's yeah. like what you said. It's like calligraphy and power at the same time. So it's like you have to, specifically in the style that we're talking about, like you've got to be able to get real loud, really, really loud, really, really strong with your voice. And you've got to be able to back off of that. And you've got to make your voice like dance and move quickly. And you've got to combine all that together with moving on stage, you know, w with acting. And that's a lot, right? And, you, and speaking a bunch of languages. And speaking That's a it. bunch of languages. Yeah, <laughs> the, right. And th those are some really difficult um, contexts and problems that you have to solve as a, as a singer that I don't think you have to solve with uh, a many other genres of, of singing. So in pop, for example, when you want to be dynamically soft, you don't care <laughs> about being heard when you do that. When yeah. you are painting your colors and you're, you know, like, um, I fell by the wayside like everyone else. I get to be soft and breathy and not care about being heard because I know the microphone is going to work that for me. And I get to use that to my advantage. But as a classical singer, they would have to figure out if when they're singing their passage, when they want to communicate softness, now you have a different puzzle. How do that you don't have when you're singing pop? How do I communicate yeah. softness in a way that is still heard by the audience? So I, I do think there's you know definitely those challenges that can be um, really hard and a lot harder than some of the other challenges that the other genres or areas of using your voice provide. But I do think that there it's not necessarily the top dog. I'm not sure we could say that, but it definitely is hard. We could definitely say yeah. that. But um, I'm not sure it's the hardest. There's a lot of other and, challenges and puzzles with, with other genres that are, that are very yeah. difficult too. Well, and the, the calligraphy is nowhere nearly as detailed and precise and fine as it is in pop music. Hmm. We, sh we have to be really clear about that. Um, that 
for instance, what, like what, when we first started interacting, mm-hmm. and I would, I would say this is still very true, that um, y- you're talking about levels of detail in the sound color and texture mm-hmm. and even and a palette of colors and textures that is much, much broader. It's, you have so much more variety in what you do uh, and that's really appreciated in pop singing and not I guess not as much in musical theater where they no. they tend to want like a more mm. uh, typical sound yeah. but in pop music you're kind of expected to come up with your own sound like something yeah. that sounds original yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's going to involve coming up with a new combination of colors and stuff yeah. and yeah. there's there's just a there's a level of detail that the opera singer thinks they know about because they <laughs> they they do work on details yes yeah, that's true but when you go to a community that's mostly uh, contemporary singers and you're an opera singer so like i was like is it two years ago three years ago we started interacting mm-hmm. maybe more I don't know. and no prob- that's, and, that's probably right and I, I like i remember being being frustrated that my illusions were, were being burned away <laughs> about the, you know that I would be able to handle anything because I sing classical mm-hmm. you know I thought <laughs> I thought oh, I'll show these guys <laughs> 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 and <laughs> and then it was like I couldn't even hear that I use vibrato on every note. Yeah. I wasn't oh I wasn't aware of it yeah. because it's it's so much just like a part of especially like r- romantic early romantic and romantic singing but also just Mozart and stuff we tend to do this all now. Mm-hmm. Uh, the style today is vibrato everywhere. Yeah. Um and I would try to sing something without vibrato and I it was a big effort just to hear that it was there in the first place. Yeah. And and this is like really the tip of the iceberg with the colors that pop singers are able to. Mm-hmm. I, I think that like that's because of the context of the genres and classical. Your need, the puzzle you have to solve is to be heard primarily, and that's what yeah. you probably care like the most about is being heard. And in pop, you don't care about that in any way at all and that makes the massive difference between classical sounds and pop sounds and that also kind of guides the um reason why pop music is so focused on detail because you can hear more because there's a mic because now you can start to hear and appreciate colors that were inaccessible if you have to be loud it's inaccessible breathiness is for the most part inaccessible if you have to be loud you can't do it but with pop you know we can kind of have a little bit of this flavor if we want right and it'll work and we could keep the volume though we could we could add a little bit of creaking flavor to our voice and do something you know and texture it that way and you don't get to do that if you have to be loud because those things just don't right. work <laughs> to be loud. Right. So, you know, those demands that the genre forces on you restricts what you're able to do. Yeah. Um, so another, you know, a good example, I think, because we were talking about the physicality and um, it's, it's good to actually to remind, especially the classical singers, that if they think they know what breath control is, it's because they've never learned breathy neutral. They like they they've never learned how to deliver like five breathy phrases in a row. <laughs> uh, because if they did, the first thing they would tell you is, "Oh my God, my abs are sore." Yeah, you know what? <laughs> That's breath control. Th- that- what we do isn't breath control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to make, it's, that's really sparking an idea in my head, which is that all of the pedagogy, pedagogue, pedagogue, pedagogy, help, pedagogy, 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 all of that pedagogy <laughs> is, <laughs> it's been like how many years now and I still can't say that word. Is it, will I ever learn? Probably not. Um, so 
all of those ideas about singing and learning to sing from classical are to do with using your body to fulfill and meet those requirements of being loud yeah. of, of and making those stylistic um, uh, choices. Those have certain sensations. So if we say sing from the diaphragm, for example, and we say your body needs to feel like this when you sing, this is breath support. And you can't sing healthy without using good breath support, right? And it's a classical idea. It's from Belcanto. We want to use this idea of breath support. That is only going to feel and work that way, technically, physically, when you're doing those kind of sounds for those kind of contexts. And so, like, all of these ideas about do it like this, it should feel like this, this is what's healthy, it only makes sense in that context. So it's not going to feel yeah. that way. It's not going to, your body's not going to respond that way to the same idea of like, let's say breath support. Like you should feel um, your body stay out more in space while you're singing a phrase. You should feel, um, I don't really know how they would describe it. And what are some common classical ways of saying that your breath support should feel like when you sing classical? Well, they, they use this word appoggio. Oh, that's right. And appoggio means, uh, you know, when you, when you lean on something, that's appoggio. It's uh, it's appoggiarsi. Means like uh, like you're using something for support. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll get all kinds of different opinions actually in classical about the correct point of appoggio. They call it. Mm -hmm. So the the point in your body where you think you're kind of leaning mm -hmm. into. Um, but it's good to keep in mind that the, the point of all this is to maintain a high, steady subglottal pressure. So that's the pressure that's under your larynx. Mm -hmm. um, and w what you can notice is that um, classical teachers will often say, no, 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 it's low pressure. It's low. They'll, they, they will swear to you that it's low. And they really believe that because at some point they were using too much and they pulled it back a little bit to the right level, which is still high. <laughs> um, and then they will say, oh, well, see, look, look how much sound I can make with low pressure. Mm -hmm. But if we actually measure the pressure, it's like, oh, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, and if you're singing some... Um, if you're singing in neutral, for instance, and you're, you're not very high, you might not want a lot of pressure at all. Mm -hmm. But if you're taking your advice from a classical singer yeah. or from a classical teacher, their version of low pressure is actually really high pressure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and you know what? That's, a, <laughs> that's the problem with when you try to like use classical to explain contemporary vocals, just let's right. just re, like explain it that way, because then you're going to be thinking, well, this is high pressure, this is low pressure. It's like that's not really low pressure. Low pressure is like, can you deliver five phrases of breathiness? You know, I fell by the wayside, like everyone else. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, but I was just kidding myself. Or every moment that feels different. That's that's low pressure. You know, and but that's gonna f that's a different low pressure than the lowest pressure you would use for classical. So uh, it's not the words that we use to describe what your body and your voice can do for classical is missing a massive amount of things you can do because it's yeah. only designed for this. Again, here's your capacity, and the other genres <laughs> are somewhere in here, and here's like classical. The, all the stuff is only designed for this box for the most part, right? And, yeah. you know, when you try to do these other things, it just – it's not going to work. Some things will work. The best thing that would work is if you learned how to actually learn in a way that you have um, uh, transferable skill. Like you learned how to use your body. You really understood what you were doing. You got good at it. That And then that learning process is very transferable. But singing high and, – and I did want to talk about this, by the way. So I, I would like to segue yeah. to this. There are elements of classical singing that I do think really help with contemporary vocals. Um, so let's say we want to sing R&B, and we want to sing really high, or we want to sing gospel, and we want to sing really high, or we want to sing rock, and we want to sing really high. 
uh, R and B. By the way, you also have your runs. Yeah, we do, and we and you have runs, which, which will get which will get better from singing Rossini and Mozart and all that. Stuff. Yeah, absolutely, because there's an emphasis in the classical of a lot of flexibility and moving your voice quickly. So yeah, totally. Um, and um, by the way, one of my favorite opera singers, uh, Juan Diego. Fl uh, not, not. Oh, I thought you were gonna say me. <laughs> one of my, you are one of my favorites. But Juan Diego Flores um, is a, a a pretty famous guy, and he also sings like um, uh, Spanish, Spanish Mexican uh, music, and it. Um, he, it's got a, a much less classical vibe vibe but a lot of it has a lot of like floor like like fast moving um passages where he's got to do like some kind of riffs or runs and he really is good <laughs> and makes that sound really good in the context of the spanish music like it sounds beautiful it doesn't sound classical but it sounds like he's really nailing it so for him the guy that could do this and trained to do it in classical you know he can do it there but maybe he didn't i mean the guy is you know spanish or uh Maybe he's not. Maybe he's. I thought he was Spanish, but who? Whatever. Um, I don't know where he's. I, I forget where he's from. I thought. Yeah. It, I thought it was Spain. I maybe think I'm, he's from South America somewhere, but I'm not so? sure. Okay, so well, he he maybe he actually learned to do the classical stuff from learning to sing that Spanish music and like growing up singing that kind of stuff, learning to move his voice quickly, doing that, and then it actually transferred to opera. So yeah, it, that's possible too. But anyway, um, yeah. Um, it's uh, another thing to keep in mind is that within the world of of classical singing. So you you brought up Juan Diego Flores, for instance. They aren't united. So you you will find tons of teachers who will tell you that Juan Diego Flores sings um, in an unhealthy way. Mm -hmm. Uh, that it's it's all wrong, 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 right? Um, and me, that's usually coming from someone who could not come anywhere close to doing for an audience what Juan Diego does for an audience yep. in his genre. Hey, so he's gonna hey hey. Haters <laughs> gonna hate, hate, hate. Yeah, it's basically it's it's haters gonna hate, but it's like an institutionalized version of that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's completely true because a lot of times those who can't do it teach, and so you you'll you right. get a lot of failed um, career singers, opera singers, right. make right. their way into the university program, and and uh, to me like. Just so that makes sense to you guys, you got to look at the whole the whole thing is set up. To teach at a collegiate level, college level, in a, in a course, you've got to get your bachelor's. You've got to keep going. You've got to get your master's from somewhere. You've got to get your teaching certification. You have to network and get along with the people that are running the show. It's like, it's, it's like you're going into the room, and everybody's like in the room doing their thing, and who are you? Like what? You're going to go in there? What? You're going to shake up? the establishment of teaching hello <laughs> no no you're not good Wait, luck isn't that what i'm trying to do <laughs> yeah 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 you are but but from but not from the inside uh but so you try to go in there what how you get your foot in the door is by being likable is by fitting in is by working with those people and that's how you get to be in the position that's how you that's how you get there so you basically get indoctrinated into the whole scheme into the whole setup and let's say that you want to you go into that wanting to be a, a, a singer not wanting to be a teacher as very few people <laughs> start singing and want to be a teacher interesting interesting thing that tends to happen by the way um you go in there wanting to be a singer and not wanting to teach and um then what happens is y you you get better and better at, well you you, you you learn, you learn, you learn, you're, you're improving your singing, and then you try to go out and sing. And um, if you're not successful, what's your fallback? Because how much money did you just spend on that degree? That master's, that doctorate in yeah. singing performance? <laughs> LOL. Um, I have one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how much, money, how much money <laughs> did, you, did you dump on that? And then 
it's like, what do you do with this if it's not working to make you a successful singer and making you yep. money and you're actually doing what you do? What do you fall back on? The degree to now teach. And now you're going to teach something that didn't even work for you because you have to make money. And so I, th I, I think this is the whole like like this is the big problem is that we have money tied into this and people want to protect their financial you know needs basically and so you have a lot of cognitive dissonance and dishonesty yeah. and like just uh, bad beliefs because they, people want to they will swear to you that actually it did work yeah but that's just their natural voice right right exactly <laughs> they'll say oh well she just has this kind of a voice that's why they can do it or yeah. your baritone teacher will say i just can't sing high c because i don't have that kind of a voice i mean i'm not <laughs> making this up we're not making this up like this has happened to me so many times when I was first learning how to sing a guy who had a degree from a university and was directing a musical told me I was a bass baritone because I struggled to sing an F4. Yeah. Why did I struggle to sing the F4? Which, by the way, guys, was at a time in my vocal development when I could actually learn to make sounds like I could do. Ah, 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 ah. I could do stuff like that. But why was I struggling to F4? This guy heard me struggle at F4, you know, and then he said, you're a bass baritone. Not even knowing my capacity, not even knowing what I could do, not even thinking, why is he struggling at F4? But just saying, oh, you're struggling there? Baritone. Yeah. That's the kind of things that they do. That's how they're – like, like, of course, there's, like, there's better people than that. But there is such bull crap there. And I, I, I think that's one of the worst things about classical – we were trying to talk about the best things, but, um, <laughs> were we? <laughs> yeah, we were, but that's one of the worst things is, is it, it, it really is one of the worst things in terms of like voice type. They're one of the most biggest abusers of like, I can't do this because of my voice type. And I you see that way less in more contemporary pedagogy than you do in classical. But anyway, I want to shift this back to what well, I could name another good thing though. Me too. And I'm about to do it. <laughs> Cause I, <laughs> what I was trying to say was, um, was, uh, Oh, Giannis, the, uh, live stream is going to be here for a while. Um, I, I think what we'll do is we'll open it up to some questions. And if you guys want to see some like demonstrations of something, you know, like how, how would you do something more classical and then how would you be more contemporary? And maybe we could like describe the sensations or something like that. Um, yeah. And then maybe we could just sing, we could both sing the same passage, for example, and see like how, our ability is sort of our, our background is informing the choices we make with that both in contemporary and classical and then maybe we could like help each other adjust it really to show you guys exactly what we've been preaching about transferable skill and like community sharing wrap that chat up okay so um <laughs> what what i think is very helpful is if you learn to sing high in classical you learn how to sing closed vowels so you learn how to sing E, you learn how to sing U, you learn how to sing E, you learn how to sing uh, you learn how to make um, sounds that you're going to be able to actually formulate words with if you learned how to sing classical. Like, and that is, so if you get your voice to go up a scale and maintain some semblance of a classical sound. Well, I guess I'll just do to the C. Uh, and not from the C, that C. So I'll do... Oh. So it's in the direction of something classical. The fact that my voice can get that sound, <clears throat> that that coloring, uh, and that that aesthetic, that actually I feel is very very related to my ability uh, to never use that sound in my contemporary singing. It's very very related to my ability to sing e and u. So if I have this kind of <clears throat> It's not bad for a bass baritone, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> for a bass baritone. Yeah. So, um... <laughs> like me. Um, what was that? Me. That was an E. Hey, Greg's bass gains are coming up. Uh, See, you got nothing on it. <laughs> my bass gains. My bass gains. I've actually been working hard at my low notes, <laughs> but it's still the morning for me. So uh, <laughs> part of it's a lot. Yeah, I get extra. You have to add plus plus four to all my low singing because it's late here. 
<laughs> ah, okay, yeah, sure you do. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there's some truth to that, though. All right, so let's say I take a more opera sound on the high A. Ah, ah, ah. It's dark. It's kind of got that, you know, more classical aesthetic. And what is that? How is that similar to if I want to, you know, with a contemporary sound? That's not classical sounding. You know, we are the champions. How does that we, how does that have to do with it? Well, that's sort of similar on a technical level. And I would overlay this with, an, with explaining it in CVT language. They're both reduced density. So my ability to get the darker color to my voice means that my voice uh, needs to reduce density which means that my vocal folds need to stretch more in order to accomplish that. Th rather than when I raise my larynx, it's easier for them to be uh, shorter and they're not gonna stretch as much. But when I do an E, even with my larynx raised or an OO, that's gonna have more of that stretch too. So it actually feels like pretty much the same thing to me. So if I go, I would classify that as the same sound, just brighter and darker. And so I would say, okay, because the position of my tongue and my larynx, right? And my body, if I do E, like I don't have to hold my body out in space quite as much. Uh, e I, I, but if I, if I want to lower my larynx, in order to, to accomplish that, my body's, I've got to breathe a little bit differently, for example, right? So, uh, but for me, that's highly transferable. When I, and so when I was learning how to sing and learning how to sing high and I was copying these opera singers, um, I would, what I was focusing on was, of course, the high notes. I mean, I never listened to the baritones. Who cares about them or the basses? <laughs> boring, boring. Um, I would <laughs> listen to the if tenors. If they were supposed to care about baritones, they would be tenors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I really cared uh, about the high notes. And I would notice that I was, I would try to get my voice up there. I would really feel a lot of distinct um, new sensations to accomplish that. So as I would go higher in the scale, for instance, for, for instance uh, if I were to do it more contemporary, I would go, you know, um, uh, uh, I would go more like this, more of a brighter s color, something that's going to work more for my the genres that I want to sing. But then I would I would do the classical thing. I would just try to copy the sound. Oh, and I would feel like, whoa, that is new right there. What is that feeling? Like, what is that sound? And I would really start to notice a lot of different things in my body and in my voice. And those same things, I started to put the piece together, like the same shakiness that I get at that note when keeping my larynx down. Uh, let's say, right? I'm fabricating it, but uh, let's say it wasn't consistent. Uh, and it was shaky. Um, that same shakiness, I would have the same problem in a seemingly unrelated part of my voice on an E vowel at a lower pitch, for example, for example. And, and it would be like, well, I would start to see that must be the same thing. And, and it actually is like it's both reduced density in CVT. So my inability to keep my voice stable and consistent in that, let's say, mode and in that color, like was really, really related to the s seemingly unrelated ability to sing E vowel high without shaking. So for me, that put a lot of pieces together just on a, like on a basic level, our voices work similarly, even if we're singing different genres, like as you go higher and higher, the vocal folds are going to stretch more. And, you know, like just learning how to do that with classical, I think makes you stretch your vocal folds more typically. And that helps you sing those kind of closed vowels. Um, and, and develops that. And it's one of the ways that now, like coming from having that experience, when I work with people, one of the strategies I use to get them to not yet say yell as they go up and to find a different kind of coordination, uh, I, I, I use a low larynx. So I'll be like, hey, put it down. Oh, so you feel that? How the sound is shifting way down there rather than, ah, I don't even feel the thing yet. <laughs> so um that was part of how that was really really helpful for me and vibrato all right i'm done where are you going with this your turn well i just <laughs> wanted to i want to <laughs> i wanted to share my experience of how trying to sing classical and some of those elements helped me right. develop my voice and my abilities in a way that 
I don't use for classical. And a lot of that well, was. I'll take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, go ahead. No, that's it. Okay. Yeah, I can. I can just tell that story from basically it's it's the same story from the other side. But when when we met, my high C was broken. I don't know if you remember. Dun, dun, dun. Um, <laughs> I, I, I got remember. I got really mad at at one of the guys in our in our group because he he picked on my high C, and 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 I was trying to argue like well I mean I hardly like I never sing it on the stage anyway. Um, because I, I'm doing these more kind of like robust roles now, and there's, there's barely any high C's and uh, blah blah blah. Yeah. And um, when you're singing contemporary with my voice, you don't get to stop at high C. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have to sing a lot higher than that. Yeah. You know. Um, and probably not. Uh, in in such a robust way, so you're gonna yeah. have to be a lot more delicate and yeah. skilled about it. I, I hate to say it, but yeah. um, it's it's not just singing wrong, <laughs> which is what a lot of classical people believe, or they will believe it's like unsupported. Yeah, yeah. And the but these coordinations are actually really hard hard to get. Yeah. Um, yeah. All you gotta do is try. And, and see how abysmally you fail, and then you understand yes. that that's because it's difficult. You either cognitively, you do some magic dissonance in your brain, and you go, that's because it's just wrong, and my vocal technique is so healthy, yeah. and it's so difficult for me to do. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, a good, a good example would be, do you remember the nasal pivots? What, what was a big deal that uh, when I was especially first first exploring, mm -hmm. and and the the phrase because it, in classical singing generally nasality is really frowned upon, mm -hmm. um, unless you're singing in a language that specifically has nasal vowels, mm -hmm. and even in that case, like when I when I sing in French, a lot of times I take out the nasality and I replace it with twang mm -hmm. uh, and maybe some medial narrowing. So that's these, these two kind of things in the back of your mouth that can come together like this mm -hmm. um, to make the opening more narrow, uh, basically between your throat and your mouth. And I'll replace the nasal on, uh, on. Uh, with this kind of like ah ah, and in the in the context, you'll think it's nasal. Mm -hmm. um, but in the contemporary singing, I really had to start allowing for for this possibility that I'm going to open and close my nose just to get the 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 sounds to agree with each other. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and the the line was the same. Um, and it was this stop so that the you go from nasal and the second note is nas it, not nasal to nasal mm -hmm. on the second note yeah. and that somehow ties them together yeah which is the last thing you would expect if you were <laughs> a classical singer yeah uh, because to you it, like in the classical genre and the way that the sound ideal mm -hmm. is set up if you suddenly introduce a nasal vowel you're you're gonna it's gonna be like oh, what? <laughs> I, I think not just color wise but also density wise in terms of cvt and if you guys don't understand yeah. that idea it's just like you could think of the capacity or loudness of a voice its character is going to shift and reduce to something more thinner sounding just by opening the nose like that's what tends to happen is that you open the nose you're actually going to pivot in the density and it's actually one of the tools that i use uh i made a video about how to sing i in taught voice. him everything he yeah. knows <laughs> i um i did steal the word nasal pivot from you i like that a lot um especially as uh, when you apply it to singing phrases it really is yeah. like you pivot from it open to closed and you can do that very consciously as a way to control your voice and your technique 
Um, and that that word appoggio that I, that I talked about earlier, you know, was which is the kind of like you could think of that like a pivot point. Yeah. And so where where I was used to having this pivot point either like down here or even in my back, mm -hmm. down by my kidneys. Um, this is a the pivot point is like in my nose right. or just behind my nose, and it's a weird feeling. It's uh, um. I mean, I got used to it, and I learned how to work with it, mm. uh, but really required coming to the the problem that's in front of me uh, with kind of like a fresh mind, like re with an open mind ready to actually solve this problem and not just use this problem as a way to try to bully everyone to saying that I solved it when I didn't actually solve it. <laughs> right. Okay. Hold on. I got to, I messed something up with scheduling. I got to take care of that emergency real quick. Okay. I'm a, a dunce. I will be, uh, I'll be right back. Feel, <laughs> feel free to, uh, talk to them, interact, you know, go to read what they're saying in the chat or something. I yeah, yeah. BRB. I sent you the link, so. I already did send you the link, so you should see it already. In uh, in our in our private message, no, uh, no, on Facebook. Oh, I, I guess it didn't send. Yeah, that would, huh? All right, there you go. I'll be right back. Oh, um, I think that I muted you somehow because I turned off my mic and I think I muted you. I don't think they could hear you. Could they hear you? Philippe, there is no sound. Don't waste your breath. Okay, now they can hear you. Okay, hold on. I'll, I'm coming. I'll be back. But they should be able to hear you now.
Wait, still no sound from Philippe? That's not... Y'all... That's not right. I shouldn't have... <laughs> no. Wait, yeah. Your audio in OBS is not picking up anymore. When did it stop? Guys, when did Philippe's audio stop? Imagine they're just hearing me and they just didn't say anything the whole time. That would be pretty funny. Uh, that's weird. I don't know why that started occurring. Ooh, can you guys not hear me now? <laughs> You're wondering when the technical difficulty would appear. It was here before we even started, and I was I was returning to my regularly. We started an hour late with only half the sound. <laughs> yeah. Oh wait, now you're back. Okay, there we go. I figured it out. Sort of. My inbox? How how is my oh. inbox? You're good. We did it. I did it. Oh, okay. I'm the best at technology. So not that long ago, right? You guys heard most of that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think they heard any of what you said. The whole time? Probably. Well, maybe uh, maybe not. I don't know. What did you guys hear? All right. It should be working now. Da, ba, Can you hear me now? Oh, when I returned to my desktop, that's when it stopped. Is that, is that so you all could hear when I left and then when I came back for a second, you couldn't hear it anymore? Okay. We're both on. We're both on. Uh, but basically, so we have to start over. <laughs> So I, I think it would be cool if we uh, segue it a little bit. I feel like we've covered a lot. Um, yeah. You know, about classical singing. It really is not just, I, I think, a blanket statement that you can say. And just like, you know, it, it doesn't work that way. So you have to um, really dive into what that means when somebody says that. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, uh, like a really important thing to keep in mind, too, is... Uh... Like, a, a, a lot of classical singers will say something like, um, like when you're not in the room, when they're only talking to other classical singers, mm. they will complain about how much opera sucks these days and how the singers aren't as good as they were in the old days, you know. And by the way, yes, they are comparing live singers uh, to recordings that they can turn up as loud as they want or whatever. And they're also recording, uh, re um, comparing modern recordings that are really cheap to make by comparison. And so we record everything. Like people bring their cell phones to shows and stuff and they record. Um, and the, like the cost of, of making a recording today, if you don't factor in the orchestra and stuff, um, is really low. And so we're, we record a much higher percentage of what's performed today compared to like in the 1950s. Um, so if, let's say you're a famous singer from the 1950s and we're listening to you now, what we listen to is the fillet of your career like we we hear all your best stuff mm -hmm. um and the chances are because it was expensive to make recordings you know no one's gonna actually release that shitty recording they're going to like reuse the tape or they're, they're, they're just they're not going to do that um and at the same time you're not able to go and check and see how consistent these people are if you actually go and listen to them live. Yeah. Um, so you get this impression that, and there is some truth to it, um, but you get this impression that opera singers today suck compared to before, and that incl that that includes me, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
and they'll say that when you're not in the room as a contemporary singer. And then when you're in the room, they're going to tell you that if you can sing opera, you can sing anything. So it's like, in order to be able to sing anything, go to these people that haven't been able to teach opera singers how to sing well. <laughs> yeah, the plot, it just gets worse. <laughs> it just gets like worse. Where? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Why? Um, but but so it's disingenuous, right? Because yeah. when you when you're in the room, what they want is that sense of authority. Yeah. So all of a sudden, they belong to the elite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when I'm in the room alone, whatever, and they 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 think maybe they can convince me that I I need to make them my teacher or something. This is, and I get this a lot. Um, then all of a sudden, um, they're they're trashing all the modern singers, and they're using the old singers from the 50s mm -hmm. to get authority. Mm -hmm. And so it's like what, they'll just change their story depending on what they think is going to grant them that authority, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that you stop questioning things. Yeah. So that and yeah. Yeah. So. Um... Well said. I think it's very true. Um, let's segue this a bit um, and open it up to the people currently watching to the audience. So, hello, audience. Hey, I hope, guys. I hope your day is good. I'm sorry I didn't say hi to you guys today um, and ask how you're doing and where you're watching from. Um, but hi. <laughs> um, do you guys have any questions that you would like to ask Philippe or I? Relating to our topic, somehow, please. <laughs> Not just, I can't sing above D4, help. Um, you know, and uh, or if you would like to see, maybe like I mentioned earlier, a little bit of, um, a little bit of like demonstrations of how we could, like uh, how we make something more classical or less classical and the kind of thought process that goes into like singing in those different ways and how that vocal technique completely shifts i mean when i work on singing a little opera phrase the tools the the things i focus on like what i'm going for shifts dramatically from when i'm sitting here with my microphone recording into logic trying to capture you know the quality of the voice that i want it's like it's utterly different so just to just to kind of bait that a little bit yeah if you guys have any questions and while while we're waiting for questions mm -hmm. uh you also have a very different feeling about comping compared to how, how I would instinctually, not instinctually, but habitually feel about it. Mm. Um, so if, if uh, you find out that um, the way that the, the voice recording was made was by doing a whole lot of takes and then choosing the bits that work out the best mm -hmm. from each take yeah. and Put putting them together to make a composition. Yeah, all pop songs. <laughs> all pop songs are, are comp in yeah. this way. Yeah. Um, and that's not scandalous. Yeah, it's not. Uh, but for instance, if you reveal to someone, for instance, the, the, the fans of these old school singers, um, there's a, from the 50s, there's a really famous one named Mario Del Monaco, who almost infamously or famously, whatever, could not sing his high C in public. Um, and even like in a studio, he would miss it like most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so when it came to live performances of operas with a high C in them, um, they, they had tricks for like, uh, changing the music a little bit so that it winds up on a B. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually, there's, a, there's an opera called La Boheme, and that's a pretty famous transposition, is what they call it. Mm -hmm. And to give you an idea of how much effort that takes, it means that every single person in the orchestra has to get new parts written uh, so that they can change the key like that kind of on the fly during the show. So that's that's an expensive thing to do. Mm -hmm. And in order to give the impression that this guy could sing the high C, 
what they did was they comped. So this is the early version of how we make uh, pop recordings. Mm. And they won't believe you. A lot of people just won't believe you that that he, he con it's it's kind of it's like it's documented and it's also documented that he never sang it in public, right? Mm -hmm. Or rarely. Yeah. That he usually uh, changed the notes. And um, that's a scandal to them. And when I make my um, my karaoke's or my um, you know, covers, I guess. Mm -hmm. When it, when I put my stuff on YouTube where I'm actually singing, yeah. um, I'm thinking about forgetting about this strong conviction I have that it should be one take. Damn yeah. it! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, that, that like combining takes together is kind of thought of as I don't know what's the word. Yeah. Like, prod. Right. Yeah. Right. I get you. Um, I don't think that exists in contemporary. I mean. It doesn't exist with the successful like cover channels with and it doesn't exist like with the successful um, like mainstream stuff like nobody's yeah. doing it in one take take you know what I mean it, it, it's not to say that when you go to listen to them live it's not a good but it's not as good yeah it's not as good and that's because now it's got to be perfect <laughs> so gone are the yeah. days when you could have a little off note right here and a little something like it's got like the the demand has increased for our ears to be satiated by like every note being correct and it being like yeah. bang on and so you know you know they're even doing that to the live vocals the live vocals are now having you know getting auto-tuned yeah. getting adjusted you know so as it's coming out of their mouth so yeah i, I don't feel bad doing it <laughs> working on a project yeah and doing it but i i do think that like that applies a little bit more when you're a vocal coach than it does when you're a singer when you're a singer doing it um for pop it's it's like whatever but as, as a vocal teacher yeah you do want to show that like yeah i could sing live for example because you could re right. really have a lot of serious issues that if you're not able to get through a song live like you know, you do need to be able to do that as a singer. And you're like, yeah, okay. You could actually yeah, be a successful yeah. pop singer and suck at live singing. That's the cra That's the thing about today. That could work. But as a vocal coach, if you're saying, like, here's how to sing well and sing successfully, you should yeah. be preaching what you're repping, which what you're representing, which is, you know, like, um, you could sing through songs and get through a set of music. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, let's well, take a we're, sorry, but where I was going with that was that opera singers will often really look down on this. And I know there's like not a lot of opera singers in the audience, probably. Um, but if that's your thought process, then uh, you should you should keep in mind that in a competitive industry, all of your competition is going to have the same um, help that you have. You know, so like if you're if you have auto tune, OK, but they have auto tune as well. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't give you an advantage. It just puts you on a level playing field with them. Mm -hmm. And you're you're going to still have to bring something to the table mm -hmm. uh, to differentiate yourself. Anyway, that's that's all. It is. So let's take a look at the chat and see these questions. Hi, Samuel. Uh, hi, Kaj. Um. Hi, Rosanna. Hi, Kefir from Russia. Um, we have one from Kaj. What are you doing? Oh, oh, you were. Exp I, <laughs> I got confused. I'm, I'm, I was looking at the. I'm the reading, live. but I'll put this on the screen <laughs> so, you, so you can see that I'm actually just uh, reading the uh, questions. No, no, I'm sorry. I saw the chat and then you were doing this because you were talking and I was like, why are you doing that? Because I thought it was the Skype one because there's a delay. Just checking my email. Yeah, I, got, <laughs> I just got confused. So Kaj is asking you, Philippe, what would you consider to be the main difference between veristic tenor singing and something like, let's say, Rossini or Bellini? Rossini or well, Bellini? Yeah. So I would say that ideally, and this is, uh, I, I mean, especially based on the latest historical evidence that we have, hmm. is that in the time of Bellini, and before we call that the bel canto era, uh, the bel canto era, <laughs> era. <laughs> um, 
people were using much lighter coordinations. And actually, if you if you look at the way that music is written, instead of having like the whole orchestra playing one big chord at the same time while the singer has to somehow sing over them, you'll see like they, they take the whole chord and they spread it out over the measure. So it's an arpeggio. So mm -hmm. it's like, instead of like blah, it's like bop, 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 beep, bop, bop, bop. And the, the singer sings on top of that. Mm. Um, and so you, you'll be combining, um, you'll be, you'll be tuning a formant, which I don't know how much your audience knows about this stuff or not. I don't know either. Uh, <laughs> to a higher harmonic. Um, so basically, I mean, I could, I could try to demonstrate, uh, so... Let's say I sing. Um, so if if I sing like ah, ah, that's different from ah, ah, and it's clipping in both cases on my end. I hope that's okay. It sounds um, fine to me, so there should be okay. Uh, I'll read the comments. Okay. If Philippe is clipping, guys, let us know. And if it's, yeah. I think so, the, like, this this first example is going to work f better for, for kind of dramatic, more dramatic singing. Mm. And this second example is going to work a lot better for uh, Rossini and Bellini. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm using different, I mean, I call them tracks. Uh, it's a little bit similar to the modes in CVT. And um, I'm going to be able to articulate higher, especially like above F4 if I have a whole bunch of words, mm. which you will see often in that style of singing. Mm. It's, and it's, it's lighter. Yeah. Um, and... I'll be able to sing higher overall. So you see, like, uh, uh, Bellini writes like a high F for tenor. And then fast forward 50 years, and high C is basically the top. Um, I sang a D flat in, in the last, um, the, the last uh, performance that I did on YouTube, the last music. Yeah. Less singing thing, Kar karaoke, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I I did that using my kind of uh, shall we say more robust coordination, and that took a lot of practice to get mm -hmm. a D flat out of that coordination. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if I use a lighter coordination, it's not a problem. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're going on to the next question then. So it's lighter in intensity, in sound color. Um, it's, it, it's, it's easier to spit out the consonants that way. It's e because it's easier and lighter, you can sing higher with it, and the music is written higher. And I'm sure you're probably also seeing more like florid passages and runs and stuff and that type of music as well, right? Yeah. So. Yep, yep. Um, so let's Because uh, all, all those things are going to be easier. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's the same with contemporary, by the way. If you're trying to really wail on some notes, the louder you are, the more difficult it is to pronounce your consonants and stuff. I was just working with a singer yesterday, and we were working on Bruno Mars' uh, Please Me with Cardi B. Please me, baby. So that song. And um, he was, like, getting really loud on some like the more like it goes up to maybe like it's like an f sharp and there's a bunch of words da 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 and it's like you can't da 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 if that's turn around and just please me if you're going too loud on those that could be a problem especially if when you're trying to fit the sound ideal of pop so one of the solutions yeah and he was feeling some you know some discomfort one of the things we just did was we found we reduced the volume. <laughs> we changed the vocal coordination, and ta-da! Right. Now it's way easier to say and get through those words, and we actually save a little bit of that heavier sound for when he's got to hold out, please, please me. When we hold out a note, that's our chance to get loud. Right. And we have a nice extended phrase, but when we have a lot of consonants and diction, I, you know, I think it works the same way. It's the human voice. 
So um, and you were you were just by the way in a, in a mouth position that's like uh, this kind of spread position. Yeah. And if you look, if you go back in history and you look at like paintings or drawings, whatever of singers, mm -hmm. um, you will see in this in this earlier form of opera, you'll see this mouth position. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure you know, like you you're not gonna get a dark opera sound with this mouth position, like the one that you think of as, um, you know, I can't I can't make. Uh, Ah! Out of uh, out of this. Ah! Yeah. Oh, it's gonna. <laughs> yeah. But I can go. You know, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So um, we have uh, hi Ethan from Denver. Samuel says, Greg, <clears throat> I hate you and die. Just kidding. <laughs> YouTube, don't demonetize me for that. Okay, it was a joke. <laughs> um. <laughs> He says, definitely take a phrase from a specific contemporary song genre and play it to Philippe and make him do it. And the oh, other okay. way around, too. Philippe taking a difficult phrase from some opera pie. Well, okay. wait a minute. Why, why does my phrase have to be difficult, but you didn't qualify the, the phrase that because Philippe has to do? Because I'm difficult. an opera singer. Anything you give me will be difficult. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I didn't see that inherent premise there, so... All right, we're See, good. I'm starting off from being an opera singer. I so. love it. Okay, all right, we, we got it. Okay, so yeah, let's do it. You, you, you first. Um, uh, you first. What are we going to do? Uh, well, okay, it's got to be something you know, right? Or yeah. No, it doesn't have to be. We can just listen to it. Wait, actually, the pop, uh, more popular, the better, because the more people know it, the better. Yeah. So, the, the, so how about... Resonate with it. Have you heard any of the new songs on the radio? How about this? Everyone knows this. Okay. Eh, uh, what's... Yeah. My Miami still in me. Oh, you want, me to, you want me to go first? Yeah, you were supposed to go first. Well, you said... Oh, you want me to go first? As yeah. in you're going to do the pop thing. Okay, okay yeah. you go first. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, have you heard any of the new stuff on the radio? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That would have been the best thing. Well, I like I live in the Czech Republic, and all of our radio songs are like last year's radio songs from over there. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> What's the most recent pop song you can remember that's really famous? Uh, somewhere over the rainbow. No. <laughs> <laughs> any Justin Bieber? Uh, any Shawn Mendes? Uh, uh, um, um, um. What about Take Me to Church? Okay, we can do that. Because I don't re like I don't really know the song, but I was in the gym, uh, you know, and like it came on, and I tried to imitate it, and I was like, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's do it. So. Um... Let's pull it up real quick. Um, take me to church. How do you do that? Anyway? I, I'll, I'll just look it up on YouTube. Uh, take me to Charar Char. -char. Uh, yeah, I should, I should. I'll bring up the the, <clears throat> the lyrics here because. And what we'll do is we'll actually watch the live one with Hosier in the um, subway. Because we're going to be able to see his body. By the way, guys, whenever you're trying to study something and learn something, it's always best to go with a live clip so that you can see what how the thing is using their body. And Sorry. It's, it's, it's okay. It, it's a lot better than looking than just listening to the audio. Just listening to the audio is still good. Um, but there's some things that you can't take away from the audio, like the position of the mouth shape quite leaning the posture it, it's it's hard to sort of see those kind of things and there's there's this kind of like je ne sais quoi uh, of empathy that you get when you watch somebody it, with their face and you can kind of like see what they're going through and that can kind of trigger similar um, vocal qualities when you try to mimic that yourself and i think that's not as strong when you can't see them so yeah um, all right. I Which found one it. are you watching? I'm pulling up the uh, "Take Me to Church" from the subway. From the subway. Okay. 
So let's find some bit that is going to go into. Hmm. Mine's slow. There we go. Of course, we'll go straight to the high part because that's yeah, the only part that that's matters. That's the only straight. part that matters. <laughs> yeah. are, you ki are you kidding me? Of course. Oh, is that a different key? Uh, I think so. I think this one's like a half step down or something like that. Or maybe a whole step down? I don't know. Take me to... Yeah, that's low. Whoa, that's way low. Bro, he must have had a cold... Yeah. He lowered the key by a by a major third. Because it's like take me to church. It's like really <laughs> yeah, that's not cool. What the heck? Uh, all right, hold on. Let's find let's find a different one. Then he's gonna be lip syncing probably. <laughs> <laughs> this is low too. You can't even do it. Hi, sad. He looks really relaxed, though. Yeah. <laughs> Which one are you looking at? Well, that was BBC. Was the same key? That low key? We'll just pull up the original audio. Okay. Since we can't get it, and we'll just listen to that. <clears throat> I'm starting to lag more now on my internet. It's not um. It's not working quite as well. Woman, amen, amen. There it is. All right, you got it. Take me to the So let's go to the part before it. So let's work our way and let's see how you do in the lower range. And this is more conversational. Okay. Uh, my my lover's got humor, or whatever that part is. I don't know the song that well, so I need to pull up lyrics or something. Okay. If the heavens ever did speak, she's the last true mouthpiece. True, she or he? Who cares? But she. If the heavens ever did speak, she's the last true mouthpiece. Okay. If the heavens, if the heavens, if the heavens ever, da 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 da. If the heavens ever did speak. There you go. She's the last true mouthpiece. If the heavens ever did speak, she's the last true mouthpiece. Okay, good. So I think what I want to work on here is the way you go from word to word. Um, okay. Let me hear that again. If the heavens ever did speak, she's the last true mouthpiece. Okay, so um, she's the last is going really well. She's the last true. Can I hear that? She's the last true mouthpiece. Last true. Last true. Yeah. What am I trying to do? Make the true a little smaller. Last true, last true, last true. It's like last a, true. La, like that? It's still a little, a little more than mine. Last true, last true. There you go. Okay, it's smaller, but make your voice a little louder. Last true. If heaven ever did speak, she's the last true mouthpiece. That's pretty nice. No? Yeah, that's pretty nice. But can you get more of a make the consonant small, but not your voice small? Last true, last true. The consonant. Yeah. She's the last true mouthpiece. Not bad. Let no. me hear it from the. If the heavens. If the heavens ever did speak, she's the last true mouthpiece. Okay, not bad. Last true mouthpiece. Let me hear that. So just last true. No, last true. Yeah. 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 She's the last true mouth. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's a bit of your, the opera stuff kind of informing yeah. it. And that's you what. Must get every single. <laughs> yeah, consonant. 
we really when we sing the contemporary stuff it's like very lazy and you gotta like you gotta make it very like blended like you're drunk she's the last real mouthpiece if the heavens ever did speak she's the last true mouthpiece good La let me hear last true mouthpiece with a little vibrato on the mouth no that, that, that part doesn't matter Last true mouthpiece. Mouth, mouth, mouth. Last true mouthpiece. Mouthpiece. She's the last true mouthpiece. Mouth, mouthpiece, mouthpiece. Let me hear that. What am I trying to do? Uh, just mouthpiece. I just want to hear that. But I... anything I should think of when I know? Not yet. Last true mouthpiece. Maybe a little too mouth. Peace, mouthpiece. My, I'm like shortening it. Last true mouthpiece. There you go. Hey. Okay. I sang mouth mouthpiece. Yeah, you're saying last I, true mouthpiece, mouthpiece. But I mean, I sang I sang mouth mouth like f. Oh, mouth. okay, yeah. yeah. And I Jeez, I didn't hear that. Last true mouthpiece. Yeah, very nice. Very, that very works. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So let's do it from the so, from the beginning part. Consonant substitution. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I do that a lot when I sing. There's a lot of like these consonants that are not right um really the real consonant and i just cheat right <laughs> and nobody can tell <laughs> right. that's very ventriloquist of you yeah thanks Before, <laughs> <laughs> all right let's try it again from that part uh if the heavens if the heavens ever did speak she's the last true mouthpiece okay uh i like the breathiness um let me hear it without any breathiness if the heavens ever did speak, she's the last true mouthpiece. Can you almost make the louder stuff come from whatever come from the position of the breathy stuff? So if the heavens if the heavens If the heavens ever did speak, she's the last true mouthpiece. Maybe like less volume on your so make it more similar. If the heavens if the heavens, if the heavens, if the heavens ever did speak, she's the last true mouthpiece. Okay, that's nice. Uh, I had a nice sheesh. Yeah. <laughs> What's going through your head doing it that, on that last one? <laughs> mouthpiece. Mouthpiece. Come here, newspaper boy. <laughs> come on, go down in my shirt, little boy. <laughs> you want some candy? <laughs> If the heavens ever did speak, you'd be the last little mouthpiece. Oh, life. no. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. <laughs> You're out of focus. Okay, there you go. You're back in focus. All right. So, um, oh, what, what's, thing. what is going through your head when you did it that way? Like, making it more like the breathy one in, like, color and in, like, just more similar when you go louder. Um, well, I was, I was thinking about controlling – the breath, like from here, which is which is something I barely do, mm -hmm. uh, in when when I sing classical, you know, I set up my posture and I go and <laughs> yeah, this, this feels like it feels like someone else is breathing for me. Mm. Um, whereas here, I really have to be careful if I don't want that bump. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Not, you know. Yeah. There's gonna be a natural bump unless I actually make a counter bump. Okay. Basically, is what it feels like. Okay. So um, let's try it again. If the heavens, if the heavens ever did speak, she's the last true mouthpiece. That's good. Um, maybe mouth a little loud. If the heavens ever did speak, she's the last true mouthpiece. If the heavens ever did speak, she's the last true mouthpiece. Yeah, um, it's pretty good. Last true mouthpiece, mouthpiece, mouse, mouth. I keep saying, I keep saying, I hear mouth. Last true mouthpiece. Yeah. Last true mousepiece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mouthpiece. It, I never thought that would be hard to say. Uh, but yeah, um, maybe Last a little extra. Mouth. Yeah, a little extra emphasis like that. Mouth, mouth, mouth. Like go right to the note. Last true mouthpiece. Last true mouthpiece. Mouth. That's you. Mouth. She's the last true mouthpiece. Again, mouth. Last true mouth. She's the last true mouthpiece. No. Mouth, mouth. Last true mouthpiece. Mouth. Oh, you don't want the slide. Mm -mm. 
She's the last true mouthpiece. Better, but make that transition from true to mouth. Last true mouthpiece. Last true mouthpiece. Now quiet mouth down a little bit, but still give it that emphasis in the line. Last true mouthpiece. Last true mouthpiece. Ah. A little more. Last true mouthpiece. Yeah, that one's not bad. Last true mouthpiece. Uh, I'm having trouble figuring out what you want. Um, a little bit, uh, it's kind of saddling a little more uh, with the volume. So, not last true mouthpiece, last true mouthpiece, but somewhere maybe a little more in between. Last true mouthpiece. Last true mouthpiece. Yeah, can you keep mouth like all the same volume? Mouthpiece. Last true mouthpiece. There you go. Let me hear that again. She's the last true mouthpiece. Yes. Ah. Yeah, but it was a little too much. Yeah. She's the last true mouthpiece. There we go. Okay. How did that one feel? Good. Okay. I had I feel I had to delay the diphthong was was seemed like a big deal. Okay. Not mouthpiece. Yeah. yeah. It's She's weird. She's the last true mouthpiece. There's almost like you have to put the inflections in a certain way in order to get it stylistically to sound correct. And a lot of this stuff is things right. that like I just do naturally or assume from listening to the right. music and copying it so much. So it's like, what are you doing that's so, so subtly different that like and starts for, the color? For me, it's mm. it's hard to, it's like, a, I know I must have done something different, <laughs> but <laughs> I can't, well, one, I can't always, like I can't necessarily perceive it, but then it's, and then it's gonna be hard to remember because it's yeah. like not part of a language. Or yeah. I don't know if that makes any yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, it does, like, it does. It's like trying. It's like somebody teaching you a phrase in a language that you don't know, and then you're trying to remember that language. If you actually know, like more language, more of that language, and you can tie that information to other things yeah. you understand, it's going to be right. something you can remember. Like if I learn a new word in English, right? Yeah. I can be like, oh, that's like this, like this. Is this is the synonym? Right. Da, 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 right. Yeah. So let's think about this idea of like when you sing your pop music or more contemporary sounds. Think of not changing too much all over the place. So when you do breathiness and when you go louder, they need to be more similar to each other. Um, so it can't be like, last you mouthpiece. It's just too much. It's like overdone right. with the volume changes. It's gotta be more- We call that word painting. Yeah, <laughs> word painting. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's gotta be like, line up a little bit more. If the heavens ever did speak, She's the last true mouthpiece. Oh, I'm my my volume changes are subtle. If the heavens ever did speak, she's the last true mouthpiece. Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad. Okay, okay. good. Let's go on. Where should we go to? The part before the amens. Command me to be well. That part. How about only heaven I'll, I'll be sent to is when yeah. I'm alone with you? That okay. one? Yeah, let's do it. The only, the only heaven I'll be sent to. Okay, one, let me hear it again. The only heaven I'll be sent to. Okay, I want to introduce this idea too, to think about your accent while you sing. Like, um, what is your pop accent, right? Like, how are you more... American? I don't have an accent. Yeah, are you... <laughs> <laughs> are you more, you know... Hollywood? Are you more um, um, British? Like, where, where, where are you coming from? What's the archetype for your accent? Um, so, if we're doing Akron, Ohio. Okay. <laughs> so we got to tie it, all, and this will help you kind of tie together the similarities to keep it more similar. So, like from the, um, um, what is it? If the heavens ever did speak, 
She's the last true mouthpiece. So whatever that feels like inside, we want to make that your accent and keep that kind of like the way you're pronouncing. If the heavens ever did speak. Uh, what is the w the phrase we're on now? Uh, uh, I forget. Um. We were born sick. Yeah. So it should feel similar on that. We were born sick, but I love it. Uh, wait, we weren't there. We were earlier, huh? Uh, wait. Where did it go? It's before that uh, we were born sick. The only heaven I'll be sent to. Yeah, yeah. so there's almost like an accent there. Only heaven, only heaven. I'm exaggerating how it sounds, but it's almost a bit of that. Only heaven I'll be sent to. I'm alone. Only heaven I'll be sent to. Yeah, there's almost like a bit of a southern style in there. Only heaven I'll be sent to, right? To exaggerate. Only heaven I'll be sent to. So if you're not doing it earlier, I would say don't do it now because then it sounds like you're switching up the singing right. accent or dialect. So it doesn't really match with, um, um, she's the last true mouthpiece. This sounds more. Only heaven I'll be sent to. More like that. Only heaven I'll be. Only heaven I'll be sent it's to. Almost like, only heaven. Hey, 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 hey. Maybe a little brighter. Only heaven. Only heaven I'll be sent to. Say heaven. Heaven. Yeah, think a little brighter, like a valley girl. Heaven. 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 Only heaven I'll be sent to. Okay, let me hear it again. Only heaven I'll be sent to. Only heaven I'll heaven. Let me hear your in. Heaven. Only heaven. Then, then. Maybe dark that one a little bit more. Only heaven I'll be sent to. Okay, one more time. Only heaven I'll be sent to. Maybe open heaven a little more. Only heaven now. Only heaven I'll be sent to. I actually like that as a little splitting, right? On that top note. Only heaven I'll... I don't know if I can reproduce it. No, it's different. It. <laughs> yeah, but that was quite nice, actually. That was quite nice. Only heaven I'll Ooh. be sent to. Nice. Okay, let me hear that again. Only heaven I'll... Ah. Only heaven I'll be sent to. Okay. Um, keep going. Uh, what is it? Is the... Oh, actually, before you move on. You're going only, only, and that gives you yeah. an accent. Only heaven I'll be. Only heaven I'll be sent to. Only heaven I'll be, 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 be. Only, only heaven I'll be sent to. You're still only heaven I'll be sent to. It gives you like a, the, 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 almost like a lazier sound too. Only heaven I'll be sent to. Only heaven I'll be sent to. Only, only, only. You want E, yeah, not the E. Yeah. Only heaven I'll be sent to. And now you sound like you have a different accent. Just changing those little right. spots, it like colors the whole thing slightly different. That's yeah. the crazy thing. Only heaven I'll be sent to. Good. You sound younger now, this... too. Yeah, and it felt more like indie. Okay, cool. So I, I think. Like this is something that happens when I teach um, people from uh, that aren't native English speakers. It happens a lot where they subtly right. mess up a vowel here and there. And now I hear the whole thing with an accent, but then they fix one or two spots and suddenly they sound way more like they're American, right? Singing. And that's what happens to me in Czech. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Except a lot worse. Yeah. Yeah. So it, when we do a lot of work, like really focusing on the consonants and the vowels and it just colors it the right way, I guess right. the devil's in the details. Right. So that was quite right. nice. Let's do that again. Only heaven I'll be sent to. Only heaven I'll be sent to. Very nice. Maybe a little bit of a cry on the heaven. Only heaven. 
Only heaven I'll be sent to. But way less strong. Only heaven's too much. Only heaven I'll be. Only heaven I'll be sent to. It's like it's barely there. Heaven, heaven. <laughs> like a <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Only heaven I'll be sent to. Good, but only heaven. Only heaven I'll. Only heaven I'll be sent to. Good. Good. Okay. Only heaven. I'll be sent to. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the next part. When, when, uh, no, no, wait. We we skipped this part. Only heaven I'll be sent to. I'm alone. Let's just skip to that part. Command me to be well. Eh, eh. Let me listen to it. Yeah, right there. Where is it? What are the what are the words? Command me to be well. What? <laughs> what was that? Command what me to the... be well. Command no. me to okay. be well. <laughs> it's not pronouncing anything. <laughs> uh, okay. Man, me to be well. Good. I like how you you did the e. Creaking? And did you like my creaking? I didn't hear that. Let me hear I, it again. Command me. Mm, I command me to be well on the m. I have command. Mm, mm, that'd be nice. Can you get it? Yeah, right on the top. Come. Command me to be well. Command me to be well. Get, get it without a little bit of me. It's a little too aggressive there. Command me to be well. Command me to be well. Nice. Well. A little more open. Well. Command me to be well. Yeah, there we go. And sounding a little more pop. Now, command me to be well. It's, uh... command, command me to be well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more time. Command, command me to be well. Good. Very. And then you can... Just dip along that vowel. Well. Well. Yeah, you already did it the first time too, okay. and then you did it right there. So, open it up and close it. Command me to be well. Command me to be well. Good. And then go on. A. A. Amen. Good. From the first part. Hey, was it? Da 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 da. Amen. Da 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 da. This sounds quite good already. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Let me hear it again. Yeah. <laughs> I sing up. I can sing anything. Yeah. <laughs> Let me hear it again. Amen. I think what I want you to change is to not bounce up the scale. Amen. Maybe a little less breath on the a is really pronouncing it. And that almost sounds opera to me when they're like, oh, it's almost like you're doing that. No breath or nothing. And what am I trying to do? To take a little bit of that a little emphasis, a little pop for the okay. notes. A a yeah, a a a a a a it's much lazier. 
this way. Amen. Yeah, the way you went from note to note was good, and then you just need to combine that with the pitch precision. Right. That's the hard part. Yeah. Amen. Good, good. Okay. Uh, I gotta go. <laughs> the time uh, flew, and I have uh, my next. I have a lesson, and I skipped my first one. <laughs> oh, okay. So well, I gotta. Let's do another. Yeah. Because there's and we should. Uh, well, I'll try to. I'll see if I can answer some questions in there. I know someone asked about the singer's formant, and that's a good. That's a really good. Uh, yeah. Thing to talk. About. L lots of good questions, but yeah, I uh, I've got to run. Um, so. Thank you guys for – wait, there's a camera. <laughs> I'm, like, looking over here. Thank you guys for uh, coming out, uh, watching the stream. Sorry to – Thanks, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to end it a little earlier than I would like, but, uh, yeah, time restrictions, and we're both windbags. Uh, me more so probably than, than Philip is. Uh, so, yeah, I hope you guys like this, and hopefully we'll get to do more. We should do another one where we just flip it, and I get to sing opera. That would be cool. We can do it on my channel. It would be my first live stream. Yes. I'm I'm down. Let's do that. But your your people seem so much nicer than mine. <laughs> they are. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for the positivity. It's what we love. All right, guys. Uh, au revoir, then, I guess. Um, thanks again. All right. Bye, Fleep. So I, I'm going to stop our Skype call and then the um, and then the stream. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone. Oh, bye, everyone. And use this <laughs> hand because it's brain better. Yeah, but it